People often ask me what's involved in having a sleep study. So I'm going to try and show you the sleep laboratory and some of the wiring and leads that we use and then how we look at the data. So this is an example of one of the rooms where we do a sleep study. So a typical sleep laboratory. One of the things we do to try to control is light. So we will generally use heavy curtains. We're also going to try and control noise. So double glazing on the windows, again heavy curtains to control the noise. One of the things we record during a sleep study is video. So we use infrared video, often positioned above the bed, and an infrared video camera to record video. And then positioned behind the head of the bed is a digital amplifier, and there's a lot of electrodes that run into that. And I'm going to get wired up for a sleep study, and I'll come back to you and tell you what all those leads are. So now we're wired up to have a sleep study, I'm going to talk you through what the leads are and what they actually measure. So there's lots of leads, but it's all pretty manageable once you're wired up. It does look a bit uncomfortable, but in actual fact, I can move around pretty freely. So we have leads on the scalp, and they're to measure what the brain's doing during sleep, called EEG, or electroencephalography. Some leads on the side of the eyes to measure eye movements, uh, and some leads under the chin to measure muscle tone in the upper airway. And then a lead to act as a reference, and another one as a ground, and that cuts out a lot of the electrical magnetic interference, so we get nice clean signals. We also have something in the nose that measures airflow, and that's a good way of just detecting um, whether there's a problem with airflow during sleep. A temperature sensor that sits just outside the nose and mouth that also measures airflow. It's a bit of a backup signal and what we used to use until about five years ago. We have a band around the chest that measures how much the chest is moving in and out as a measure of breathing. A band around the abdomen that measures the same thing, and if those things are in sync, then breathing is usually pretty good, but when they go out of sync, it can be a sign that there's sleep apnea. There's some ECG leads that you can't see. Uh, leads on my legs to measure muscle activity in the legs, and something on the finger to measure oxygen saturation. Lots of leads, but they all go off into a digital head box, and that's connected into the network, and goes back to the control room where the staff are watching what's going on during sleep. If you do need to get up and go to the bathroom during the night, you can let the staff know and they can disconnect the box and then you can head off to the bathroom and then back to bed and they'll plug you back in ready to go. So once we've recorded all the data, that's often where the hard work begins. And we actually get a lot of data from a sleep study. We record about 16 channels of data, um, eight hours of data, and we look at it in up to 30 second pages. So it can be a thousand pages worth of data things that we look at is looking at the brainwave activity. So the top leads is where we look at what the brain's actually doing. So it gives us an idea about what type of sleep uh, people are having. As we scroll across the screen, the lower amplitude is where people are asleep. And then there's these sudden disruptions of higher amplitude and faster frequencies. And that's when someone's been um, disturbed from sleep or had their sleep disrupted. The whole screen's five minutes of data. So you can see within that five minutes, there's lots of disruption of sleep. The channels towards the bottom of the screen tell us about what's going on with breathing during sleep. So the blue line is the signal in the nose that measures airflow, and each time that goes up and down is a single breath, and there'll be a sequence of three or four breaths, but then a period of about 45 seconds where no air is getting in. The brown leads below that are the bands around the chest and the abdomen, and they show us that someone's still trying to breathe or making an effort to breathe, and trying harder and harder as time goes on, and eventually it gets to a point where the brain senses it's difficult to breathe, the muscles in the upper airway contract, people take a much bigger breath and often a snoring or a gasping noise, the oxygen levels come back up, and then the whole cycle starts again, drift back into sleep, upper airway muscles relaxing, the airway closing over completely again for another 45 seconds. So that's an example of severe obstructive sleep apnea, and an example of how we use the data from a sleep study and try and integrate it to look at what's happening both with sleep, the cardiovascular system and breathing, and that's something that's very useful for me in how I manage patients clinically. For the A to Z of sleeping well, head to the hub, sleephub.com.au.